Okay, hello, welcome back. Um, I, I came across something interesting online, so I'm going to talk about that, but to kind of introduce it, I, I need to talk about um, the concept of consent. Um, consent is one of those concepts that's pretty simple and straightforward to understand, but when you it comes time to define it uh, for legal purposes, it becomes incredibly difficult to define. Um, Basically, all it means is if you have consent, you have someone's permission for something. Whether, you know, it's to do something, whether it's, you know, just whatever. You, you have their permission. That's pretty much all it is. But the problem is, when you try and define it legally, you, you run into some interesting pitfalls. Um, so, first off, uh, we're, we're going to express kind of all these in, in sexual terms because that's kind of the easiest examples to give of, of consent. So let's say two people uh, consent to have sexual relations, pre which is pretty straightforward. Um, but let's say that at least one of these people is um, drunk, so drunk that it becomes questionable whether the consent is valid or not. Now, an, an interesting aspect of that particular example is that it varies from it, it, whether this can, constitutes, whether a person can give consent when drunk, generally, in most people's opinion, varies depending upon the gender of the person. In most people's views, if a woman is drunk, she cannot give consent, and the man is obviously taking advantage of her. The same logic doesn't apply to man, men in a lot of cases, not all of them. That if a man's drunk, he's presumed to still be in control of facilities enough to um, give consent for sexual activities. And this becomes even more obvious, this uh, contradiction becomes more obvious when uh, both parties themselves are completely drunk. And, you know, they try to assign blame for uh, the action, uh, and it's generally the man who gets blamed, even if he was, you know, almost to the point of being unconscious, so drunk he's almost unconscious, he still generally gets the blame. <laughs> and so that that's like one of the problems, whether people are under an influence of some other substance or something else. Um, another interesting problem of consent is uh, the problem of age. Now, um, the age of consent, and we're talking in sexual terms, but it can apply to alcohol, drugs, whatever. But the age of consent um, is pretty much an arbitrary line, but despite that, it's very necessary to have that age of consent. It, it's, it's just almost vitally important to have that. Uh, but what is commonly not understood about um, the age of consent in America is that it's not a federal law, it's a state law. So you're probably saying, okay, so what? What does that mean? That means the age of consent actually varies from state to state. Now, while the majority of states in the United States, the age of consent is 18. However, there are a few states within the United States where the age of consent is as low as 16. So like I said, that, that can lead to some interesting problems. So let, let me give you an, an example. And to my knowledge, this has never been done. Um, or I've never heard of it being done, let's say. But let's say we have two people who consent to have sex with each other. Um, one of these people is 17, and they're living in a state where the age of consent is 18. Now, let's say for the example, for the purposes of this example, that uh, they live five miles away from the state line, the border between one state and another. And in the state on the other side of the border, uh, the age of consent is 16. So, after consenting to have sex, they cross the, the border between states and engage in sexual activity in the state where uh, the 17 year old would be uh, of legal age. Now, I'm not recommending doing this. In in fact, I can think of two law two laws that that the uh, older person could potentially be charged with for doing this. However, it's one of those really bizarre problems with um, consent that would take uh, lawyers that lawyers would take hundreds of hours and millions of dollars arguing over, um, and probably at the end of the argument, they still wouldn't have decided whether, you know, a person can even be charged with breaking the law in this case. So, so those are some of the very basic problems with the uh, age of consent. And, excuse me, and 
it kind of leads us to this interesting uh, video I came across online. Um, I'm not really going to give very much information about this video, and I'm doing that for the same reason that certain uh, news organizations will not release the names of, say, school shooters or terrorists or things like that. It's simply because they don't want to give these people attention. And in this particular case, it's not as bad as shooting up a school, but it's behavior I don't want to encourage, and I don't even want to encourage it by, you know, even mentioning it or talking about it. I'm sure if you put enough effort into it, you can find it yourself, but, you know, I'm going to say don't even bother, just because. Now, I honestly don't know if this was a real thing or if somebody did it as some sort of spoof or joke. I feel like I can't afford to assume that it's a spoof or a joke, which is kind of sad nowadays, but, um, so this, this comes from a, a, a young lady uh, posted this. So apparently she uh, went to the beach one day, and there were a lot of people on the beach, and they were uh, climbing up to a high point and jumping off into the water. And so, you know, she did this. She engaged to do that. She climbed up and jumped into the water. At some point during her jump, or after she landed in the water, she got knocked unconscious. Now, a, a 40-year-old man, she's quite specific on um, this, the, the man was 40 years old. Uh, the woman who posted this, the young lady, uh, looked to be in her 20s, she talked like a teenager, so I honestly don't know how old she actually is, but I, I figure, you know, around that age, late teens, early 20s. But a 40-year-old man uh, dived into the water, um, pulled her out of the water, and then performed CPR on her and, and essentially saved her life. Now, according to her own words, when she, uh, started to come around, he was uh, performing chest compressions uh, on her, which is a form of CPR, or a part of CPR, I should say, not a form. <laughs> that would be silly. Um, um, and her, her, in the exact words, she was, a part of her was, was happy that he had done that, he had saved her life, but the more part of her was really upset and offended um, that he had dived into the water, he had grabbed her while underwater, dragged her to the uh, shore, and was, you know, performing chest compressions, which almost by definition, you kind of have to uh, touch a person's chest to do chest compressions. Or let me put, let me phrase that differently. I know of no other way to do chest compressions than to actually have physical contact with somebody to compress their chest. Um, at which point she, she described um, what he had done as rape. Grabbing her underwater and pulling her ashore and doing chest compressions was described by her as rape. And then she described uh, the act of grabbing her underwater as a, uh, aquatic sex. She didn't really define that. I presume it's some sort of sexual activity while underwater or, you know, in the water. It, it was a little vague as to what she actually meant by that. And it was a little vague, whereas there she was thinking that by grabbing her, he was performing aquatic sex with her or um, whether he wanted to perform, perform aquatic sex. It, she was a little vague on, on those parts, so I'm not going to assume too much. Now, you know, this, this relates to consent. So, uh, to get to the point where consent enter into this kind of discussion that she, she's presenting, oh, one final thing she did say, she said um, she is going to sue him. She hopes he gets uh, 10 years in prison after being sued, which makes me think she doesn't quite understand the legal process. I don't know if she's meaning by suing she means she's going to have him arrested or, you know, she, you know, because when you sue someone, you, they don't go to prison. They have to pay you. So it, it feels like she doesn't quite understand that process, but I could be wrong. It's just, just the vague impression I got from her. Um, but that uh, she knows she's going to win because her father hired a really good lawyer um, to defend her in this case. So Back to consent, how, how consent relates to this. So, uh, consent, so this is pretty much a common sense application of consent and also the legal application. They actually relate very well to each other in this point. But an unconscious person is incapable of giving consent. That is the legal definition, that's a commonsensical definition of it. But there are cases where consent is presumed. So in the case of someone who's unconscious, if that person who's unconscious is in imminent danger, then they then consent to save that person's life is presumed. Uh, being unconscious 
uh, in the water, consent is presumed. So he, he did uh, have her consent to save her life, to do whatever it took to save her life. Um, yeah, so jumping in, doing that, she, he, he completely had consent. And I, I want to make this, this clear. This is not directly, directly related, but it is an important point to consider. Um, she did state that at least a small part of her was happy that he saved her life and, you know, was glad to be alive. This is important because people who have attempted suicide have actually sued the people who have saved their lives uh, because they didn't want their lives to be saved. So it, it's kind of an important little side point there if this ever enters into legal litigation. So so I'm going to kind of break down the two parts. The, the two parts she seems to have problems with is him grabbing her while she was underwater in order to haul her to the surface and uh, him performing chest compressions on her while she was unconscious in order to revive her. Um, so the, to, to the first part, I know of no other way outside of physical contact he could have brought her to shore. And even if they had equipment that could theoretically have, have grabbed her, like say a net from a fishing trawler, it would have taken time to get that equipment ready and in place to grab her, at which point she would have drowned. So there really was no other way he could have saved her life. And I, I don't know how, how many people have, have actual experience with swimming and actually trying to bring someone to shore. It's an incredibly physically difficult thing to do. Um, if a person's conscious and struggling, that's probably one of the hardest things that lifeguards have to do. But even if they're unconscious, it, human body is very hard to move. Um, there's a, a concept called dead weight, which essentially means that someone it's harder to move someone who's unconscious than it is to move someone who's conscious. It sounds really weird until you actually experience it and then you realize, oh, it, it does true. It is true. So, and once again, I don't want to presume, I don't know how much this young lady weighed, but average human being weighs between 100 and 200 pounds, adult human. And so, you know, basically he had to go into the water, um, hold on to her and, you know, someone between 100 and 200 pounds in weight who was dead weight and drag them to the shore. Um, now, I honestly, given those facts, um, I, I'm not stating that he may have not have wanted to, um, we'll say, touch her inappropriately. I don't think we can use terms like sex or rape in this case because, near as I can tell, nothing even remotely close to either of those things actually happened. Um, but, you know, he, he could have, in theory, touched her inappropriately. Um, while dragging someone to shore, one, you don't have that much time to do anything like that. You need to get the person up and get them to shore so artificial respiration, CPR stuff can be done on them. It's, you're on a time limit. So my question isn't, or my question about this isn't whether he had the, whether he wanted to touch her inappropriately or not. To me, that's immaterial because he just, I question whether he, he or really anybody would be physiologically capable of touching her inappropriately in this set of circumstances. And I would need a lot of evidence to convince me that it could have been done and that this person in particular actually did that in this set. So I don't think she has much argument for that part of it. Now the second part, the uh, chest compressions. Um, I don't know how many people watching this video have taken CPR courses, but I'll, I'll give you just give an example. So for, when you do chest compressions, let's see if I can get this up there. So you put your hand out pretty much like this. Palm out, you put your other hand on top and lock it like this. And then you, you have your arms completely straight like this and you, you move your body to form the chest compressions. It's pretty much, if you're doing it correctly like that, it's pretty much impossible to grab someone inappropriately. Yes, you're putting compression on, on parts of a human anatomy that could be considered to be inappropriate to touch, but in those seven circumstances, it really isn't. Now, I'm sure there have been people in the past who have um, used CPR as an excuse to inappropriately touch people, but also keep in mind there were a lot of people on the beach that day, and when you have someone who's unconscious and there's a large group of people around them, they get in close and you get a lot of witnesses. <laughs> they, they see pretty much everything. So, once again, if he, even if he'd wanted to, it would not have been a very good conditions for him to have touched her inappropriately. So, this, it, based upon her own testimony, what she said, she doesn't appear to have much of a case to make in this 
sense. She, he pretty much had, or uh, consent was pretty much assumed in his case to save her life. There's not really much time they did anything that would have been inappropriate. Um, so so the, this particular set of circumstances, I don't think she has much of a case. Um, I, just, I want to bring this light, and I, I want to finish by basically, I have a couple of um, assumptions, I suppose you call them, theories, just ideas that I've gotten from this. Now, I have no evidence for these. These are just based on impressions I've gotten from how she's acted, how she's behaved, and what she said. So uh, first off, um, her father. I, I have some serious issues about her father. Um, okay, so if I had a daughter uh, come to me and, and say, I've been sexually assaulted on the beach, I would be mad. I'd be wanting to you know, hurt somebody and kill somebody. But um, once I, I got this full story told to me, my first reaction would be to wonder where I went wrong as a parent. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't see much of a case for it. I certainly wouldn't finance an, an expensive lawyer for this. And I can't see any really good parent financing a lawyer for this. So if, she, if her statement is correct that her father did give her lots of money for a lawyer for this particular case, um, yeah, I do have questions about him as a father. And the only type of parent I could see doing this is someone who's pretty much, who handles children by giving them money until they go away. Um, that sounds kind of funny phrased that way, but there are plenty of parents who essentially spoil their kids rotten, but don't, don't give them anything like attention or so on. And if that's the case, that actually explains an awful lot about why she would be accusing this gentleman of um, sexually assaulting her. Um, so my, my second theory or assumption uh, is that this is really, that you, Essentially, she's not the victim. She's making the person who saved her life the victim, and it, this is really going to affect him. I mean, he's even if it never goes to court, even if nothing ever happens, if he's ever put in the same situation, he is going to seriously hesitate before doing this sort of thing. And really, it, it's going to take a really, really good person to overcome that and to save another life, and especially if he's in a situation where it would be only him and uh, a female person he has to save, and there's no one else around it. You know, his, his first reaction is like, what's she going to accuse me of? What's going to happen? So, just uh, two thoughts on that. And uh, the final thought, she she emphasized several times in the video uh, the man's age, 40, 40-ish. And it, to, there was disgust in her voice when she talked about that age and that 40-ish. Um, which seems a little unfair because, you know, 40 could happen to anyone. You know, I'd be willing to bet if you lived on this planet for, say, ooh, 40 years, you would turn 40, too. <laughs> so, silly point, but it, it is very true. And I just get this vague feeling from how she said it and from what she said that had she been rescued by a uh, hot guy who was, you know, in his mid-20s, she wouldn't have had a single problem with anything he did to save her life. Even if he had touched her inappropriately, she would be fine with it. You know, I might be, you know, I might be, you know, being a, a bit unfair to her on this. That's just the impression I get. So anyway, just wanted to share that story, talk a little bit about consent and some of the problems with it. Um, like and subscribe if you like it. Uh, come back to this channel for interesting talks on philosophy and just strange stuff I find <laughs> online. There's a lot of it out there. Anyway, like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.